But without further ado, I would like to invite Andy Tag to the stage, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. It can be really hard to be a consultant. I've been a consultant for four years now, and I have no idea if I'm doing a good job. So as a part of an experiment with the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine, I've been involved in some multi-source feedback. We've been targeting 15 of my close friends and enemies to find out if I'm actually any good at my job. I've spoken to nurses, physios, doctors, radiographers, and they've all been very generous to give their time to tell me what they think of me. And I didn't really want to know about the medicine because I get that feedback on a regular basis on the shop floor. I wanted to get to know what I'm like as a person. So, in the means of transparency, I'm going to tell you exactly what they think of me. They're just the bad bits. There are three key things. Number one, I need to drink less coffee at work. <laughs> Apparently, it's a problem if you drink six or seven cups of coffee on a shift. I don't think so. Fortunately for me, I've now been in England for two weeks. I've gone cold turkey from coffee. <laughs> it is, the stuff I've seen is brown caffeinated water, clearly not coffee, so great, a success. I scored one point. Second thing, I need to say no to things, and clearly me being on stage suggests that that is impossible. <laughs> from conversations I've had with many of you over the last few days, I've already got two book offers, three papers to write, and another couple of conferences to speak at. And I'm sure I'll still never be able to say no to anyone who asks me. And then there's the final piece of feedback, the most interesting one. Apparently, I need to be less passionate about work. I need to be less happy in my workplace, because it makes everyone else jealous. <laughs> so, I think that really says something more about the person who says this and about to me. But it's really interesting. It got me thinking. And so human beings have used nonverbal communication since before the time of language, 100,000 years ago. Charles Darwin, in his amazing threequel to Origin of the Species, felt that the emotions that we display on our face are reflected and felt most strongly by those we have in our heads. When you see someone smile at work, the mirror neurons in your brain light up. So when you see the, the zygomaticus major just suddenly make that little turn up, the same parts of your brain that are controlling their brain make you want to smile. That's not a bad thing, is it? And what's more fascinating is that there's also a physiological and emotional response. So if you actually smile, whether you're happy or not, your brain thinks you're happy. And we can prove this. So what I could do is I could invite you all to the don't forget the Botox after party. <laughs> Tickets available downstairs. Inject your foreheads with, photo, with Botox so you can't frown. You will be happier, people. And not just because you're less wrinkly. You'll actually feel happier. Now, there is a problem with this. There's a huge degree of what we call emotional contagion. So if I smile at you, you will smile back. And I can see that. The problem is there's a negativity bias at play. So negative emotional states, fear, anger, hatred, boredom, are much more rapidly transmitted than the positive ones. Kindness, compassion, caring, and calm. And this can cause huge problems in the workplace. So what we do is got a huge amount of emotional labor. It's very difficult to explain to normal people how you can be looking after a 28-week prem baby one minute, and then go straight to talking to someone who's had a three-year history of constipation 10 minutes later. And that takes its emotional toll on us. And we've all seen that at work. We've seen those negative people who can infect our day. And so I want to introduce you to three particularly virulent characters that you may have seen in your workplace. And as I describe them, I want you to have a little think about who you know that fits this mold. But once we've described them, hopefully I can teach you how not to be those people. So number one, the maverick. We've all seen that Top Gun hotshot junior doctor, usually a man, I'm afraid, it's one of those people who will be the gun. They will work their way through every single patient in the, in the department, put their feet up and wait for the next thing to happen. They're discharging people left, right, and center, but there's something not quite right. They're taking those shortcuts. What they're doing is they want to discharge that 28-day-old febrile baby without doing the investigations because they look right. 
they do the half-assed handovers to the day team because they've got a beach volleyball match to get to. And to be honest, the impatient team can sort it out anyway. How do they make you feel? They don't make you feel comfortable. They feel a bit nervous, a bit afraid. These are the people that make mistakes. The second type of person I'm going to introduce you to, the moaner. <laughs> and I am sure you have all met this most virulent character. Any tea room in any hospital that I have ever been to, you will hear their voice. They will complain about this speciality, the surgeons, the orthopods, the radiologists. And what the problem is, is very soon that negativity is infective, and you will be joining in that conversation. You will be nodding along. You will be adding to the anecdotes and stories of that stereotypical bastard surgeon, because they're not, you don't want to listen. You are making things worse. You are adding to that emotional contagion. And then there's a third sort of person I want to introduce you to, the magnet. <laughs> do not type in shit magnet to Google Images if you want to do a slide, OK? <laughs> so we all know the magnets at work as well. They're the people that cringe as soon as the Q word is mentioned, the word that should not be named. Quiet. Because what we know is as soon as you say that word, all hell will break loose. Every sick child in a 10-kilometer radius will be brought into your emergency department. Things will go missing. Things you never even knew you had, you still don't have. You have to put your trousers will split in the middle of a you know, terrible recess. And they cannot cope. They have a degree of learned helplessness. Everything is beyond their control. And so they don't even bother. They make you feel frustrated, a little bit angry. And when these facilities, when these emotional states are personified in one person, the leader, <laughs> these things are compounded. And so why is it that if you take one person and have them in these stressful life situations, they can bring your world down? And you can take another person and put them in exactly the same situation, there are no issues at all. I think, really, I want to introduce you to some personal protective emotions that we can use today. Some things that you can do that might help. But this is going to be hard. This is going to be a little bit confrontational. And that's why I didn't actually mind getting that feedback that I should curb my enthusiasm. So what do we need to think about? First of all, you've got to actually take a step and look at yourself. As Neil spoke about really well this morning, one of the challenges is actually being recognized. Are you the sort of consultant that walks into the apartment, head held down low, looking at your mobile phone as you're walking along, barely making eye contact with someone, bawling out the night team for making crappy decisions, and then but not speaking to anyone else until you've had your second copy of the day? Or are you the sort of consultant that walks into the apartment, says hi, Bikash, to the cleaner, smiles, thanks the night shift, no matter what bad job they've got had, and make sure they get home safely. What sort of person are you? Now, it's really easy for me to stand up here and say that. We all wear a mask at work. The people you are in real life at home with your children, your parents, your friends, are not the same people you are at work. So we can use some of that skill. The best thing we can do, perhaps, is learn to smile and give some positive emotions to people. So I want you to take a look at this this film, what I want you to do is imagine you're in the workplace. We're going to do a little bit of what we call surface acting. It doesn't matter, as I said at the beginning, if we pretend to be happy, it will make you happy, and that is transmitted. So take a look at the face on my left. Have I got this one around? Yes, I have. Is that a real smile or a fake smile? OK, hands up for who thinks this is a real smile. And hands up who thinks this is a real smile. OK, so what's the difference? OK, this is a real smile. It's what is called a Duchenne smile, named after that Duchenne. What he actually did is he's got electrodes, went up to some random strangers that he'd pulled off the streets and gave them a little silver florin, and then stuck them in their face to make them smile. When orbicularis oculi shrivels up and shrinks up, your mouth, the corners of your mouth go wide, that is smiling, real smiling. So let's do an exercise. Can we have the lights up a moment, please? What I want you to do is turn and look at the person next to you. You can be on your own. If you're on your own, why don't you just get your iPhone out and have a look? 
you know, it's the same sort of thing. So I want you to try a little smile. You know, and this is what you need to be looking like. So I did do a Twitter post. So I did a Twitter poll two weeks ago when I knew I was going to be doing this talk for the best Ryan Gosling picture I could ever find. <laughs> Jay Monroe voted for this one. So there you are, Jay. This is just for you. Okay? This is a real smile. This makes you feel a bit warm and fuzzy. I mean, who could be angry if you worked with someone like that and smiling every day? And that's great. That's what we can do. But what about those negative people? How can we deal with them? So, you know, we talked about the maverick, the person who's risky. They take all this. So what can you do? We need to put a little bit of safety in place. Not this sort of safety, though. You know, it was lovely. And we probably saw this place exactly when we were at the event last night. But this is the moment where Tom Cruise breaks his ankle. You know, he's 55 years old. He should not be doing this. These are risks he should not be taking. If you see that maverick about to make a bad decision, it's a time to go and rescue them, to put that safety harness on them. It's not the point just to let go and this is someone else's problem. We have guidelines for a reason. We have guidelines to be safe. And you don't have to believe the guidelines. But if you don't, you need to have a damn good reason for not following them. We want to go up to that maverick, speak to them quietly, give them the opportunity to save face, let them know what they're doing wrong, and maybe we can make a little bit of a difference. So what about Moaning Myrtle? We all know about her. I think the first thing you can do is not join in that conversation. Every day at work, I'm confronted with eight boarding patients waiting to go to the ward for nine hours, a scratched copy of Let It Go playing repeatedly in the background because it's the only disc that no one wants to steal. <laughs> Parents are frustrated. Everyone is frustrated. You find yourself writing down the lyrics by accident when you're typing notes in because that's all you're hearing. So what could we do different? Well, perhaps the computer on wheels a shared Netflix password, and those dulcet tones of Adina Menzel would be out of your ears. And they can watch Moana or something much better instead. Making the parents a cup of coffee, even if it is English coffee, and as long as it is the doctor that is making it, will make a much better difference to their day. Your happiness will be contagious. Your kindness will be contagious and you will turn their moans into smiles, and you will get thank you letters for it. But then, what do you do about the magnet? I can't tell you how to, to deal with a magnet, but I can perhaps teach you how not to be one. In my hospital, on a semi-regular basis, I do work in the western suburbs of Melbourne, there'll be a screech of the brakes as a car pulls into the ambulance bay, triage buzzer goes off when we go outside. It's one of two emergencies. Normally, it's either a heroin overdose or it's someone giving birth. But imagine I am the consultant on the shift. I go outside to help to deliver this baby and I'm past its little blue, almost lifeless bundle. I rush into the resuscitator. The gas line shrieks as it goes off. As I try and flip it on, nothing happens. I pick up the bag valve mask and there's no mask. Bend down to tube. Trousers split apart. I could just curl up into a little ball. Or I could actually do something about it. So every day when I start work and I'm in charge, I will check the most important piece of equipment myself. I will make sure the equipment is there to be used. I will make sure that my team members know where I am if there's a problem, and we all have already allocated our roles. That way, there's much less chance of disaster. And, should the worst-case scenario happen, I can actually sew up my own trousers at work. I am no Ross Fisher, but I'm, pretty, I'm sure I've done a pretty good job here. <laughs> this was my crotch. So, <laughs> imagine how happy everyone would have been at work if I hadn't done that. So, do you think this sounds a little bit challenging, a little bit like, I'm telling you not to be emotive. I'm not telling you not to be happy. Should I be curbing my enthusiasm and curtailing my passion at work? Well, psychologists have done lots of studies. And if you put a moaner into a group of normally functioning people, the group becomes less safe, less happy, increased risk of burnout. And whilst 
it's difficult to know if you're one of these people who readily catches these emotions of other people. There are some surveys you can do online, and there's a link on the blog post that will just go out now if you really want to do that survey. Certain people are much more prone to catching other people's emotions. They're the sort of people that cry in movies. You know? And if you really want to test yourself, I've made a YouTube video for you, and it's on our YouTube channel. You can go and watch that after this. And I'd like to see how many of those movies make you cry. If there's, I'll be happy if there's just one, but I, you know, there will definitely be a few in there. Don't worry. I didn't put Blade Runner in, though, because they wouldn't let me from a copyright reason. Sorry, sorry, Ross. It doesn't matter. If you are the sort of person that catches someone else's emotions, if you're aware of that, that is OK. All this fake smiling, surface acting, it can seem a little bit like manipulation, can't it? A little bit what marketers do. And it's certainly something that Facebook tried. They tried to manipulate the feeds of all of their, their customers. They basically manipulated 800,000 feeds to just give them positive news. And what was really interesting is when they, the psychologists did the study, everyone who read the positive news was happier. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. It's a bad thing Mark Zuckerberg is doing, but that's a different matter entirely. So I really want you to go away from this thinking that it doesn't matter how the world is going on about you. If you have no control over Brexit, the ambulance situation, how many beds you have in your hospital, you can still make a difference to that one person who's sitting next to you in the department. As Mary said at the beginning of the week, itchy e, itchy go, we are just in that one moment of time. What we do with that one moment actually matters. And as my favorite mentor, the late, great Dr. Mark Green said, you set the tone. Thank you.